everyone. My name is Susan Bladholm, and I'm the founder of Frog Ferry. And um, I kind of came to all of this in the ferry business by happenstance. But 22 years ago, I joined the Port of Portland, and my first project was putting together an exhibit at Portland International Airport that was called the Mighty Columbia River of Trade. And so I ended up doing a lot of research um, in putting together that exhibit and worked with Chet Orloff and Linda Wisner on it. It was out at PDX, where I see some nodding heads, uh, for about 16 years. And even though I'm a native Portlander, I had you know, little keen appreciation for the history of the river. And when I applied for the job, um, the interviewers asked, what would you do if you were hired as the director of marketing? What's the first thing you would change here with the port and the website? And I said, everything is being told from the white man perspective for the Port of Portland. Mm -hmm. And we're not really looking at the indigenous people that founded this fabulous place at the confluence located at Two Rivers. And so um, I like to think that's part of my legacy that I left after um, serving with the port for 10 years. Um, my name is Travis Williams, and I'm executive director of a nonprofit called Willamette Riverkeeper. And uh, that organization has been around since about 1996. Originally, was Friends of the Willamette River, and a couple of years after, it uh, became the 13th of the, what are now over 250 Riverkeeper, Baykeeper, Coastkeeper organizations around the United States. And in this area, we have uh, us, Tualatin Riverkeepers, uh, Columbia Riverkeeper, Klamath Riverkeeper. Um, I hope I'm not missing no. anybody. Right, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, but you know, we're all independent uh, nonprofits or programs of other nonprofits. So in our case, um, you know, our goal is to protect and restore the Willamette River's water quality and habitat. And I started this job in uh, June of 2000. Um, uh, relatively green to a lot of environmental issues, not completely. But a few months after I started this job. Um, the uh, Portland Harbor Superfund site was listed on the national priorities list in December of that year, and so it was a very quick uh, process of learning about what it is and how it was supposed to work. <laughs> now, there's a lot, a lot of uh, distance between here and then, um, but uh, as an organization, we work uh, on a whole variety of issues up and down the, the full Willamette River, but uh, this has certainly been a focal point over the last 22 years for me. Um, and I want to commend uh, this exhibit. I think it's a fantastic uh, example and, and the initiative that uh, many of you took here to, to make it happen with the history and the feeling that it has, uh, that, uh, just the, the hit that you get um, of another time and maybe a time that could be in some, in different fashions, uh, uh, moving back toward some of that again. So I'll leave it there. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Bob Somlinger. I'm the conservation director for Portland Audubon Society. Uh, Portland Audubon's been around since 1902, and so we've worked on various Willamette River issues uh, throughout our entire history. Um, you know, going back 30 years, uh, really 40 years now, uh, my predecessor in this job, Mike Houck, did the first wildlife surveys along the river. Um, and it was interesting back then because uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife was required under state law to do these surveys. They didn't want to do them. They didn't think that urban environments really mattered. And so they offered Mike uh, $5,000 to do all the wildlife surveys in the entire metro region. That sounded pretty good to him at that time. And so he literally walked uh, the river and uh, mapped all the habitat that was there then. A lot of that's gone now. Um, I've been working on river issues for about 30 years uh, in a variety of different capacities from uh, uh, monitoring peregrines that nest on the bridge to advocating along with Travis on things like Superfund and working on a lot of urban policy as well, uh, things like the river plans and the economic opportunities analysis and land use planning and things like that that uh, shape how the river develops, redeve redevelops over time um, and hopefully is restored as well. Um, so I'll end there and I'll also just echo Travis that this is an amazing exhibit and it's one of the things that's really exciting to me is that um, really 30, 40 years ago as a community we had really written off the urban river. Uh, we had decided that this really wasn't a place uh, uh, for, for, it was really a place of uh, industry. Um, access wasn't that important, habitat wasn't that important um, and there's been a real shift over the last several decades and I think it's efforts like this that are 
uh, bringing it back into our collective consciousness and hopefully bringing it back to health. Thank you. Yes, um, my name is Linda Weisong. Uh, I'm not associated really with any official environmental organization. I'm sort of a, I'm freelance in that way, uh, although I am a member of the fossil fuel group of 350. But uh, and as a visual artist, um, I've worked on projects over the years that involved uh, collaborative urban planning teams. And so the idea of rethinking this future site in a more positive way is very exciting because having seen this work and not work in various times, uh, um, I do enjoy it. I, as an individual artist, I worked on the Springwater Trail with Mike Hulk, by the way. And I've done other projects such as the uh, Southeast Clay Green Street. And I had a stint as an artist resident in the South Waterfront, which was um, very interesting to sort of see how commercial development um, will manage certain sites and how that wetland really was uh, turned into a dry land with its own uh, issues. So. Um, Anyway, um, I'm here to just offer these sort of a little more um, perspective of the visual artist who's kind of hung out with the conservationists as the years go by. Um, and I also want to say thank you. I think it's really great that, that what the group has done, and I, w I think your collaboration needs a name. You, you need a name to call yourselves a so-and-so artist. So uh, I look forward to hearing that name or you brainstorming on it, because it's very cool. Thanks a lot. Well, in theory, we're the Braided River Campaign. <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of have a name. So the Braided River Campaign is because we knew that the river was you know, a series of lakes that was shallow. So, so the river was a shallow, actually to the mob thought of the name. Am I okay now? Um, anyway, that it was a braided river. We probably spent meetings, you know, anybody who ends up doing anything like this, you spent meetings just discussing a name, you know, it's crazy. But um, anyway, braided river campaign seems um, like how it ended up. And it also has some artistic uh, feel to it because it became um, a symbolic of braiding people's lives together as well as the river. So it worked out as a metaphor as well. So that's who we are. Um, we have two branches. We have this kind of storytelling art branch, and we also have our branch where our long-term goal is to um, impact the North Reach River Plan. So whether we will, we're hoping one way or the other that we are going to impact how that turns out because we kind of felt like it was headed in a direction that didn't have a lot of public voice to it. So at any rate, we're a pain in the neck to them, if nothing else. But hopefully we're an inspiration and not just a pain in the neck to them. But um, anyway, the next question is why, and you've all kind of said this a little bit, but why is the Willamette River important um, for our culture, our economy, and the social fabric of the region? Like, why, why should we care? Like, we're all like, these people that are all devoting large chunks of our life to this um, part of the river or to the river in general. So why, why is that so important? I get to start again. Well, I feel a little bit like an imposter here, especially knowing for Bob and Travis and how long they've been doing this. I mean, truly as giants here in our world. Um, for Frog Ferry, this was something I just started looking into because I've been in transportation infrastructure and economic development for 35 years in the Portland region and in Oregon. And I'm just really concerned about us paving over our community and just believe we've got to get people out of cars. And, um, and I just look at other river cities and see they've had a ferry. So I was just curious just started doing the research, never intended to start this. Um, but, you know, the more I've learned, it's been just five years for me since I really got um, you know, involved with bringing a passenger ferry service here to the region. And, um, and I think 
I've always had an awareness of why Portland is in Portland, and I was the director of marketing for Travel Portland, so I've written lots of press releases and lots of web content about Portland and Oregon and um, our history and the riches of this bountiful land. I'm also incredibly concerned about, in the business, you say protecting the product. <laughs> and I often look at all the press releases I've written about some of the best trails to hike, for instance, and I'm a pretty avid hiker, and um, how I think sometimes we're loving Oregon too much, you know, and we really have to preserve and protect what's here. And so just more and more as I've learned about the river and certainly the history here, um, I will tell you that Frog from Frog Ferry comes from um, Chinookan mythology and I had the privilege of working with Tony Johnson, who's the chair of the Chinook Tribal Nation, and we worked on an installation out of Portland International Airport about, I don't know, 14 years ago. He and their resident artist, Adam McIsaac, and after we completed that installation, they gave me a lithograph of Frog. Mm -hmm. And Frog is credited with um, working with um, Raven and Coyote, teaching the local people how to fish and collecting the nettles from the riverbank and stitching them together to create nets. So in terms of our heritage here, I believe the ferry provides a really great opportunity to talk about our heritage here um, and actually have indigenous names for the different ferry stop locations. So in terms, Sarah, to your question, in terms of the importance of the river, it's really, it's, you know, it's why we're here. It's because of the river. And, um, and then looking at our past and how we, we have a responsibility, and it's just part of the ethos of Frog Ferry, to communicate that um, through our ferry operation. It's a little closer. Um, well, there's, there's a lot you could say with that question. There's a lot of many, 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 many reasons why the Willamette matters. Um, but just a, you know, a few of them, if you think about all the, it, it, as has been mentioned already, historic peoples who lived on the river uh, and called it home, all of the wildlife that have been there over the millennia and called it home. Um, and then you look at the degree to which we have changed this river and really what amounts to a very small amount of time. And I probably all of us do this in different ways. You have a little bit of uh, creative imagery in your mind. And you start to subtract the, the tank farms. You subtract, the, if you're looking from one side of the river to the other, you subtract this building. You subtract all the fill that they put in on one side of the river or another. And you start to maybe get just a sense of what this place uh, used to look like on that stretch and many other stretches of the Willamette. Um, you know, the, the, the sense of, uh, if not wild, you know, something that is very natural and naturally functioning. Um, but I think in all of this, you know, there's an upshot. There's so many things today that are highly problematic in this world and boy, you know, it's, it's unfortunate we have a long list, but I think the upshot here in terms of why this river matters uh, for the reasons I've already stated, but you look at uh, what we might, what, what could be done? And, you know, I, I could take a canoe on a quiet morning, probably most any season of the year, and work your way along the river, um, go behind some of the ships that are moored, go behind the old structures, and you could still find wildlife, you can still find uh, relative solitude, even in that place. And it sounds maybe a little crazy. Uh, depending on all the land access points uh, don't often really afford that. But if you get on the water and you have that opportunity, you can sometimes do that. Um, and I would say we, we did a trip in February uh, and we weren't technically in the harbor yet. We were just on the edge, uh, just shy of the Fremont Bridge. And we had a group of about 20 people in canoes and kayaks. And I came around the end of that ship that is often moored uh, right by the Broadway Bridge, his name I'm forgetting. Might have been the next one down, next terminal down. And there, bathing itself on the flat concrete panels that have been dumped there, who knows when, they've been there for a long time, was a glorious river otter, just having a great time and it's stretching out. We had just the most sparse sun <laughs> uh, casting down on that side of the river. And I came around there and it was just like, you know, I, I haven't seen river otters in that stretch of river very often. You know, just, it's been a couple over the years. 
And to see that otter on that cold, yet slightly sunny Saturday morning, um, I think there, there, there is some hope, and there's many other reasons for hope, too, in relation to the Willamette and that stretch, but I thought it was something that had some significance, so um, that's another reason it matters. You know, it's interesting. Um, we, we think of ourselves as a, a green city or green region, um, but we have an inaccessible, polluted, degraded river running through the middle. And I don't think we can really be a green region as long as the Willamette is in the condition it's in. And we have made progress too. I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge things like the combined sewer overflows. So a lot of work's gone into it and it's a lot better in some ways than it was. So we're on a continuum here and uh, it's easy to sort of look at what's not going right. But a lot of things have gone right. Uh, I look at it from a biodiversity perspective, probably first and foremost. Uh, and uh, as Travis noted, um, you know, we, we built, our city in sort of an ecological hotspot. These river confluences were once incredibly fertile floodplains. And uh, the wildlife still does use it. Travis's otter, uh, the salmon that, that go up and down the Columbia and the Willamette, uh, a lot of the ones that go in the Columbia tuck into the Willamette as well. Uh, and what they're tucking into is the most degraded stretch of river in Oregon. Uh, every salmon that uses the 187 mile long Willamette River system has to pass th through downtown Portland. Um, I spent a lot of my early career monitoring peregrine falcons um, when they were still pretty critically endangered and they started nesting on bridges in downtown Portland. I had similar experiences to Travis. I'd get down there an hour before sunrise to monitor them. And when it's really quiet and still, it's amazing how many uh, animals, mammals using the riverways, beaver, otter, birds moving up and down it. Um, you know, it's just an incredible place still. Whether we degrade it or not, they're still gonna have to pass through. Um, and uh, one of the things that really amazed me when I got involved with the river, uh, frankly, was what a stranglehold industry had on the river and uh, the degree to which um, progress was uh, very difficult and forces were well aligned against making progress and I think still are in many ways, although there's cracks in that armor too. Um, so, you know, I think thinking about it from a biodiversity perspective, we have a real responsibility there. Thinking about it from a human health perspective, we have a responsibility there as well. Um, and thinking from it from a global climate change perspective too, um, we need to build much more resilient uh, natural systems uh, to absorb the changes that are coming. Uh, so whether it's carbon sequestration, reducing reduction of flooding or so on, uh, we've got to change the way we're doing things. Uh, and this river does redevelop and change over time. Uh, I go back to that stranglehold. Um, we've had many opportunities to make things better that haven't been captured because uh, there are powerful forces aligned against it. We continue to have opportunities. We need to be able to take advantage of those as they come. Great, well, yes, to everything that's been said, and um, of course, why all rivers are important. It's not just the Willamette, but the Willamette is the one we've got, so we should take care of it. Start with your home territory. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time doing projects on and around and in um, Ross Island, and I think Ross Island is a great example of you know, something that's been, the whole center has been dug out for industry to build the Southeast Portland for the concrete. Um, but the, it's still resilient, there's still wildlife there, and as the um, industry has slowly shut down, there is more and more of the natural world. And so we have the opportunity to make a difference, and um, we've got um, seven years, so we might as well get started. Thanks. Um, I just want to give anybody else a chance to answer that question as well. Anybody else feel a strong feeling that you'd like to... Why is the Willamette River important socially, culturally, economically to the region? You don't have to say anything, but if anybody wants to, they can. Water is like... That's a basic. And I, I do, I just want to say that, like what Bob was saying about the stranglehold. There we go. Oh, okay. I just want to say, like what Bob was saying about the stranglehold, and, and I, I know you're facing that as well, Susan. And I, I think 
you know, right now we're sitting here and we know there's a, a war in Ukraine and we know there's a lot of really hard things happening uh, with climate in the rest of the world. And, and all those struggles are about that stranglehold. And so, you know, it's like you have a tight ball of string and it's wrapped so tight and you're like, where, where do I start to unravel? And, you know, we're here and, and we can start to unravel here. But um, that, that the bigger issues of that power dynamic and how it was that um, people were able to displace that tens of thousands of people along the lower Willamette is, is it's fascinating, you know, how it was able to happen in such a short amount of time. Um, so I, I do think that we are unraveling a ball and you just have to grab whatever little string you can and, and start unraveling. So um, as we face um, the challenge of the North Reach and uh, the economic opportunity analysis, big, big planning issues um, in Portland city government um, where we're going to try to redraw that map, not to get rid of all jobs or industry, but to, to like what Mike said, you know, how do we find those little places we find the boats and the docks and, and just kind of make them more, make them enhance. Like, can we do both? So I guess one of the questions we have for you is, um, what are some of the challenges that you faced um, as you work um, within governments and within systems? And what might your advice be um, to people? You know, we've got some students here. You know, what would your advice be to people who are trying to make a change? Your experience is trying to make change along the Willamette as well as um, where you think we need to head next. I think it's getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and disruptive. We have a whole lot of status quo in place and who's making decisions. Um, a whole lot of lip service around public dialogue and outreach. Oh my goodness, the testimony, and I've seen Bob at some of them. I had no idea. Honestly, I, I spent 20 years with large public agencies and the outreach, and I had no idea being on this side of it. Um, it's, it's really disheartening to see going through the motions, and it's like, you said you wanted to see letters of support. Here are 250 letters of support. You want you know, more people to come testify, and so I think it's being relentless, and I think it's also finding kindred spirits, and I have to say that's the one thing walking in here today. I was like, these are my people. I didn't even necessarily know you were all my people. Um, but it is just more and more when I fall into bed at night going, you know what? We work really hard, I think, for all the right reasons, and um, this is our home, and I'm really hoping my kids will be able to raise families here, so it's a convoluted answer to your question, Sarah, but I would just say stay at it, find your people, and get comfortable being disruptive. Yeah, well put, Susan. I, I just laugh sometimes at the absurdity of things, so yeah. that's why I was kind of giving <laughs> so, the next year. Just, uh, can't um, believe it. Yeah. You know, there's, I, again, I think that's, it, it's a big question. The other one was a big question. I don't feel like I answered it, but maybe I answered a slice of it. Um, but there, there is a, you know, past a certain point in relation to any natural resource issue, there becomes tradition of a certain type, and that's bureaucratic tradition, political traditions, business traditions, um, or the norm. There's different ways of saying that, um, and they're oftentimes not good traditions, <laughs> to say the least. And so whether you're looking at acquiring land along the Willamette River 100 miles up from Portland, which is a very much a big need, just like it is here in the metro area, to provide habitat or areas that can be restored to meaningful habitat to fit a range of species, those listed under the Endangered Species Act and every, all the other species that aren't. Um, but I think that it's a very difficult thing to actually make happen along the main stem of the Willamette and even uh, on many of the tributaries. And the money involved uh, is significant. 
compared to many other things, it's not that significant, but the amount of uh, money you need to come up with to acquire meaningful habitat along the river, um, it's a barrier. And then the river finally flows into its, you know, what, what are its, technically its first few miles, really it's the end of the river into the Columbia Multnomah Channel. And you look at how little public access there really is along that entire stretch. Even in the heart of the city of Portland, we have a sea, sea wall, not a river wall, we have a sea wall um, that gets you kind of looking over it. We have a bowl that has its issues and could be way better. And uh, there's been a lot of thought over the years of things you could do to uh, improve that. Same with the seawall, by the way. You know, if you took the seawall and you uh, ratcheted that down and you had a stair step up to the top of it, that it doesn't increase flood risk, <laughs> if it's at the same height as the seawall, you're going to be at the same place you started, for example. But um, anyway, I've had people try to dispute me on that over the years. So, and then you look at the, the, the esplanade, which is great. You know, we have a freeway next to the river. And uh, again, not an uncommon thing in the United States of America, looking back with our you know, love affair with cars, and I took one here today. Um, but it's, in terms of looking at really the interface with people in the river, it's pretty shoddy in River City, USA, as we like to call it. And as Susan alluded to, lots of documents and assurances of interests and notions of support for cool projects that could better link people to the river. And yet when push comes to shove, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of leadership being exerted on any of this. And it's been that way for quite a while. There's a few exceptions that here and there over the years that we could you know, point at as to people who really wanted to make a difference in that vein. And then we get into Portland Harbor where you know, the area is pretty much locked up other than three or four spots where you are allowed access to the river. Uh, there are some glimmers of hope with Willamette Cove eventually, hopefully, probably, maybe, <laughs> providing the kind of access uh, and, and you know, some notion of habitat restoration that we all want. Cathedral Park, you look at uh, Kelly Point, you look at the small nodes of access along Multnomah Channel, and then you look at the east side, or sorry, the west side of the river, and there's not a whole heck of a lot going on. And I know that Sarah is working hard on a, uh, to try to get to the river uh, right there in Linton. But I would think, I, so that, that's my long way of saying, I think that's one of the biggest barriers, but it's also one of the biggest opportunities. I think there could be, once the Superfund process gets going and there's more certainty that all these businesses seem to crave, opportunities to have maybe some kind of new development, but also have way better river access. And I don't have any clear examples in mind other than a super fun site that exists today called McCormick and Baxter. It's 44 acres. It's on the east side of the river, immediately adjacent to the railroad bridge. Why has that been sitting there for the last 15 years since it's been cleaned up uh, with notions of the University of Portland being interested in it but at the end of the day, you have a site that is, it's the, the remedy has been implemented, it's there, and yet there's a huge fence around it. Again, that's just one example of kind of, why is that? Well, it's because one owner still controls the fate of that property, even though he has no continued economic interest in that property, he has no plans to use that property, but he still controls it. So, when we get back to the barriers, things like that, you have 44 acres, which would make a great open space for north and northeast Portland, nothing's happening. And I, I think as we go on, we have to be creative about looking for opportunities, whether it's in Linton or elsewhere along that stretch, as businesses transition, properties transition, acquisitions happen of certain properties and businesses, there could be better opportunities over time. I wish we had, you know, $50 million in the bank to go and compete actively for such properties, but that is where I think you need leadership and government, whether it's a city, a county, uh, metro, whoever else, where you can bring resources to bear and put some economic heft behind issues like that. So sorry, I didn't mean to go on that long on that topic, but it's irritating. Yeah. Uh, Travis is right, it's a big topic. Um, I'll, I'll just offer, I think, three things. Uh, the first is there's a lot of public processes related to the river. Um, you have the Superfund process, you have CERCLA, and you, you have um, uh, 
river plan, you have the economic opportunities analysis, um, you have NERDA, you have, you have a lot of different complex processes that in some ways can all be sort of put together to get us to where we want to go to some degree. Uh, it's important to know what those processes individually can and cannot do because uh, it's easy to walk in and sort of throw everything at them, but w the way you're going to make progress in those public processes is really understanding uh, the limitations of them and what is possible within that context and how you put them all together. And that, that's really for the activists in the room who are sort of doing the longer term planning. Uh, the second thing is to be focused and specific. And one of the challenges I see, and I've seen it get worse over the years, is I think we're coming in really liking to do big visioning over and over and over again. And when they ask us what we want to do, we want to do more visioning. And we want, and, and it used to be that the industries used to do all the delaying, installing, and obfuscating. They can now sit back and watch the left do it for themselves. And I've been tremendously frustrated in recent years by the degree to which I see the progressive community going around in circles. And part of the trick is to some point decide what you want to get out of it. And I mean really specific. We want a protected site no less than a quarter acre every quarter mile along the river for salmon, something like that. We want at least five access points in the north reach. And here's where we think they should go. Um, that kind of stuff, because otherwise it is really, really easy in these processes just to go to a million meetings, as I already mentioned, uh, give a lot of input and get nothing back. And the agencies are incredibly adept at absorbing your energy and doing nothing with it um, until you sort of get tired out. Uh, so I think accountability comes from specificity. This is what we want. Can you give it to us? Um, and then I think the last thing is really uh, look pulling back the curtain. Sarah alluded to the economic opportunities analysis. That is something that uh, the city has to do every five years under state law. They have to look at land, in industrial land demand and supply, and they need to demonstrate that they have a 20-year supply of industrial land. And that's usually done very quietly with industry at the table without anybody else there. No one pays attention to it because what do we care about industrial land supply? We're not an industry. Uh, and what happens is once they get that figured out uh, with industry in the room, that locks in a lot of constraints. Uh, if they don't have enough industrial land along the river, and that's what they've determined several times now, they can't convert land to other uses under state law. They have to demonstrate that they have that supplier. They're going to lose down in Salem when industry challenges them, and we have lost down in Salem. So that's one thing to really pay attention to because the economic opportunities analysis, which is going on right now, uh, really forecloses all the other opportunities that we have been talking about in this meeting already. Uh, so when you see stuff coming from Sarah or me or Travis or whoever on that, and you think, wow, that's not really of interest to me, uh, if you care about habitat, if you care about access, if you care about a, a real greenway there, if you care about planting trees, if you care about protecting floodplains, none of those things will happen until we get over the economic opportunities analysis. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I think you're so right. I've been on the outside of these processes, but I have witnessed them. And I've been to many places where they were looking for community input but they already had decided what the community input was going to be. And so you, there was actually, no matter what the community was saying, it came out <laughs> the way it was pre-decided, which is very interesting. But the thing I would like to say is um, I also, I teach, I teach college students. I'm around people who are in their 20s all the time. And I think, you know, besides all the institutional problems, there's like just, don't get too, if you, you can be paralyzed with discouragement. You know, the, you talk to people, you talk about economic, or we, I, talk, I have a class on environmental issues and art and various other things, and we read papers and all of that kind of stuff. And some people say, oh yes, let's go get them, but a lot of people say, oh, it's just, you know, the cards are stacked against us. We can't possibly do anything, so I'm just gonna go, like, eat ice cream. Now, nothing about, nothing against ice cream, but, uh, you know, uh, even a little bit, a little chink in the armor is worth 
something better than nothing. So I just, my sense is that what I can bring this to this is not the expertise, but to say, um, well, you know, everyone's needed and don't get discouraged. Add something here, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, you know, our, our mutual friend Mike Houck has a, an expression uh, that he took from the uh, great forest activist Brock Evans, Endless Pressure, Endless Gleal Pride. He asked Brock, you know, how do you stick at this on the forest year after year after year, and how, how have you gotten so much done? And Brock said, well, endless pressure, endlessly applied. And I think, you know, we are actually seeing the fruits of our labor. Uh, we do have a much cleaner river. Uh, we are seeing uh, habitat being restored on the river. And I think about places like West Hayden Island, for example, where we launched a battle against the Port of Portland in 1982. That's the first time it's mentioned in our newsletter. And we've gone through multiple cycles of massive battles with two and 300 people at hearings. We stopped them from developing for 40 years. And in 2020, the port conceded. And it's now going to be a natural area. Uh, that's 820 acres of habitat. So, you know, that's... It's amazing stuff, and it took a long time to sort of trash the river. It's going to take a long time to restore it, but I think we really should have hope because we are making progress, and we are actually winning the battle over time. Thank you. Anybody have questions for these good people about the work they've done? Or... Any questions? Super 
it's it's a federal law that um, applies typically to the highly contaminated sites. They could be of all sizes. It's a Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, and that's kind of a long <laughs> string of words that uh, forms another acronym called CERCLA. So over the years, the, the lay term for that law and that process is super fun, and really, it harkens back to when the U.S. government had an excise tax on the petroleum and chemical industries, which gave the federal government money to go in and clean sites if you had a landowner who was unwilling to do it. So they could go in, they could take that money and apply it while they took that landowner to court to basically potentially get triple the amount of money that it took to clean up the sites. So there, there used to be a very um, robust uh, amount of money for that. In recent years, recent decades, frankly, uh, that tax uh, expired in the mid-90s. I can't remember the exact year. Um, and each biennium, the federal government has had to fund that fund. And usually, they don't have enough money to apply to the actual existing need. So there's still a fund, but at the end of the day, super fund or a super fund site, it's a polluter pays law. So all the owners or those who are liable for those properties have a responsibility to clean them up. Yeah. And 10 miles of Portland Harbor is listed as Superfund. Yeah. There are 1,344 Superfunds. I think that's the number around the U.S. So we all probably live next to one or on one or in one. Uh, so oh, don't feel left out. <laughs> the 
that you would even think that the place where people are supposed to walk is a railroad track? And then it said, where do the children play? And I just said, they should be playing on a playground. Like, why? Why? Um, so I just, I don't know what all of you think about, like, the erasing of people. And, and in part, that's what this exhibit. But how do you think the erasing by industry of the people who live in that area has impacted um, the use and, and moving forward? That's, that's what I feel. I would kind of echo what Bob was talking about, and I, I think there's a huge disconnect with visioning, and there's so many big vision and strategic plans out there. And it, first of all, our community has so many strategic plans. I mean, just trying to track them, and why don't we have one really comprehensive plan? And there are a bunch of comprehensive plans out there. <clears throat> but I think um, people have gotten a little comfortable referring to like social equity and climate equity. And it's a little bit of a check the box in these plans. And I think there's a real disconnect with the actual community and what's taking place in those communities. And then actually implementing programs to help address the problems. And so it, to me, it just feels like a lot of rhetoric. And so I really appreciated Bob's comments about um, specificity and getting into actual projects and how do we move things forward. It's like the Superfund site and I was there with the port years ago and kind of heard about it and, and I've talked with a couple of the, the contributors who have said, we have checks ready to write. Why can't we move forward for, on it? And I'm not, you know, I have no, ne not nearly the expertise they do on this, but I'm like, come on, is this going to be in my lifetime or my children's lifetime? I mean, this has been going on for 50 years. You know, what's it going to take? And I guess the other comment I would have is when I embarked on my research for Frog Ferry and saying, what elected official is responsible for the river? <laughs> there really isn't one. That's a problem. I think we need to have an owner. And people right away will go into, oh, the Army Corps of Engineers and, and U.S. Coast Guard and, and uh, yeah, Oregon State Marine Board. but really in terms of owning and being responsible and where there are metrics, we don't have that. And I, I do think that's a void for us. Department of State Lands. No. Department of yeah. <laughs> so speaking about specific, do we want to go back to the Braided River campaign and specifically to that industrial site in North Portland? Is that a way of sort of readdressing those issues like what needs what are some of the steps what can happen there is it possible um do you guys you have a vision i, I shouldn't ring that word up now but uh, what what are concrete things or anything we can do to move toward changing that situation in regard to in regard to the cleanup itself or in regard to well i was thinking about the tank farm oh um, that is specifically the focused uh, with the Braided River Group. So I thought since that's their focus, maybe, I mean, there's, we could focus on any number of things, of course. But the tank farm is a particular area that is, um, has been in the news lately with Zenith and is uh, particularly vulnerable and has multiple, um, uh, what do you call it? Stakeholders. Yes. <laughs> How could we talk about that?
it's almost like rudimentary in terms of shifting the whole collective paradigm in that um, into, into really considering it uh, in, a, in a different way. You know, I, I think at the risk of um, taking this off on a slight tangent, uh, you know, agencies are very good at making things invisible, especially problematic things. They're also very good at getting high centered at one thing at the expense of other things as well. And one of the things we are absolutely hearing, we're hearing it very, very explicitly from Portland City Hall, for example, is that people don't really care about the environment that much anymore. Um, that it's about housing. It's about, um, uh, racial equity, it's about um, a variety of other things. It's about climate justice, but climate justice can be a really sort of amorphous thing that oftentimes doesn't actually really involve the natural environment. Um, and we're watching the city actually dismantle its environmental programs as we speak. Um, they're, they're literally being dismantled at, for example, the Bureau of Environmental Services. And I think it's important not to let them play that game, not to let them say it's a uh, zero-sum game. Um, and so right now, from my perspective, the environment needs a, a good uh, push at City Hall. And I think each one of these individual opportunities is important. But I think it's also important just to send a message to um, City Council, to the mayor. Uh, and this is the least environmentally focused City Council we've seen in at least four decades. Uh, that the environment is still important to people, that we want uh, healthy environments, and that means uh, parks, natural areas, habitat, tr uh, trees, green roofs, green streets, um, biodiversity, and those kinds of things. It's, it's got to be recharged at this point because uh, it really has kind of fallen off the radar screen. They just fired the friends of trees because two bureaus are fighting over who should run them. And we've had friends of trees forever, but then they do a beautiful job. And no more trees until they get fired. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a problem. It is. But they've been, they're contracted. And they just erase the contract. Well, I guess I would say, uh, you know, the idea of persistence in this whole endeavor uh, with you all, with peoples who had lived along that river uh, hundreds of years ago, I think we need to continue to just be persistent. And it's not always going to be at the same level of energy. The opportunities will, will come and go, but as long as we just keep persisting and those after us and I I've said this a lot in recent years probably because I have two daughters who are gonna one's graduating next month from college but I look at all those peers out there I mean you know some of you in the room here who are um, I think in many ways much better equipped to deal with some of these problems than uh, those who have come before you um, and hopefully your, your arc will continue in that direction and I think there's there's you know some opportunities for hope there and kind of rethinking everything about how we've done things in the last 100, 150 years and the choices that were made and uh, the trade-offs that weren't really trade-offs, they were just bad decisions. Um, so I, I think the persistence and the, the next generation, uh, you know, we're here at an educational institution, I think there's really a lot to be hopeful for on that front um, as long as we all collectively get, get there in time, if you will. I would add in every single day with my job, I think to myself, the difference one person can make. And that's for the good or the bad. And I've got two kids that are both college graduates now and can just see how defeated they feel some days. But just one person, the difference. I mean, you're showing up today. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so each of us, you know, can be the voice of change. So I do think in terms of being hopeful, as long as as individuals we keep stepping up and doing our part, um, rather than just saying, oh, it'll never happen. And for my friends that say that, I'm just like, I, I, I can't even have that conversation with you. That's unacceptable. We all have a responsibility here. Oh, oh. Are there any
examples of businesses who have um, a similar concern and who would work with agencies in partnership of doing an environmental things along the river, reclaiming or um, cleaning up their own act and making um, a lot of publicity about that. I think river industry has been fairly monolithic, actually, and fairly well organized for a while in terms of pushing back on environmental initiatives. The big change that's occurred, and it's a huge one, is the Port of Portland, which is a public agency, but which aligned itself with river industry for really uh, decades. And um, they have changed over the last couple of years. They've broken ranks with their partners on, for example, the economic opportunities analysis. Um, they have recognized that they actually have more land than they need. And for the last four decades, their position has been, uh, we don't have enough land, uh, we need more. If we just had more land, if we could just pave over places like West Hayden Island, industry would come and fill that land immediately, we'd have lots of great jobs. And so that, that change at the Port of Portland is really, really significant. They're looking at divesting themselves of some of their surplus property through their uh, uh, shared prosperity initiative, which has a social justice piece to it. It's not exactly clear what that means yet, but I think that's a huge, shift that is in part the result of a lot of pressure from a lot of groups and a lot of individuals over time. Um, and it really, I think, is the first break in the armor that we've seen, and it's a big one. So um, I think what was once a very monolithic force is now fracturing. Um, I also think the economics are changing for a lot of these businesses, which um, is going to force them to think about things differently as well. So I think we're in a time of real change uh, economically, socially, uh, environmentally that um, will open up some new opportunities as well. Who do you work with, Travis, that, that you think is progressive on the river? Huh. <laughs> um, there are individual landowners and there are segments of certain industries. If you go upriver and look at uh, some, some of the agricultural operations that are doing things in a new and in better way, actually growing food in the Willamette Valley rather than uh, uh, growing grass seed. Um, and I think also within the, the realm of a, you know, what is now a big industry in Oregon and the viticulture and wineries, that sort of thing, there are, there are quite a few people there who are doing things the right way and hopefully more will do that as well. So uh, we still have a lot of issues with what is applied to the landscape. Uh, for one example, uh, throughout agriculture in the Willamette Valley, and, and that's something that's still a big issue. Okay, we good? Okay, thank you very much.